Então, boa tarde a todas e todos. É, obrigado por terem vindo a este seminário com o Michael Leach. Hoje comemora-se 17 anos da restauração da independência de Timor-Leste e de uma forma mais longínqua, 45 anos da fundação de um partido político que começou por se chamar Associação Social Democrata de Timor, Timor-Leste, e que uns meses mais tarde se passou a chamar Frente Revolucionário do Timor-Leste Independente, Frente Portanto, e não é por acaso que as duas datas coincidem, é porque de facto a Frente como a maioria de que dispunha na Assembleia Constituinte, uh, conseguiu fazer coincidir as duas datas, a restauração da independência e a fundação da, da Fretilin, o que do ponto de vista histórico causa algumas perplexidades, porque a restauração da independência não é de facto uma coisa de exclusiva responsabilidade da Fretilin, e pelo contrário, foi preciso encontrar meios de fomentar o diálogo entre a Fretilin e outras forças para que essa independência fosse possível. Mas é o que temos. E hoje estamos satisfeitos por comemorar a restauração da independência em 20 de maio de 2002. Esta hora, esta hora em Timor já, já é quase dia 21, ou se não é mesmo já dia 21. Portanto, eles já tiveram uh, o seu dia de festa, nós, nós faremos a festa agora. O Michael, não vale a pena, eu diz ali o que é preciso, é professor, o que nós diríamos cá catedrático, portanto é, é full professor, uh, na Swinburne University of Technology, em Melbourne, e acima de tudo é um amigo, um amigo meu, um amigo de Portugal, um amigo dos timorenses, e tem um trajeto pessoal que começa nos movimentos de solidariedade com o Timor e que uh, acaba por ter uma componente académica e cívica que se conjugam muito bem. Uh, o Michael acaba de publicar há dois anos um livro fundamental chamado National Identity and National National Building and National Identity em uh, Timor-Leste, um livro fundamental para se compreender uh, o dia que estamos hoje a celebrar e como é que isso é decisivo para a vida dos timorenses. O Michael continua a sua cruzada em prol do povo timorense, tendo sido uma das pessoas que na Austrália mais uh, posições públicas tomou a favor da posição, a posição timorense no diferendo com a Austrália a propósito do petróleo do Mar de Timor e da limitação de fronteiras. Portanto, de alguma forma, o aspecto da intervenção cívica do Michael eh, prolongou-se para além da independência e eh, tem inclusivamente sido reconhecido pelas autoridades, nomeadamente pelo Xanana, que ele tem desempenhado uma função extremamente importante junto da opinião pública australiana a favor dos direitos do povo timorense. O Michael é também um velho conhecido do SES, aliás, a primeira vez que eu conheci o Michael, a primeira vez que o vi foi em Coimbra, faz agora nove anos, o Michael esteve cá por três semanas em 2010, na altura eu vim cá no meio da queima das fitas e jantamos juntos e, e foi aí que nasceu uma amizade uh, que o tem feito acompanhar o meu trabalho e de outras pessoas, uh, sendo, tendo sido uh, consultor de um projeto que eu tive com a Susana de Matos Viegas e sendo agora consultor do projeto que dá cobertura à vinda de OK. O projeto que nós temos chama-se A Autodeterminação de Timor-Leste, um estudo de história transnacional. Interessa-nos ver 
uh, o problema da autodeterminação de Timor-Leste não numa questão bilateral ou numa questão meramente de, do Timor-Leste como uma entidade, mas o conjunto de, de, de redes em, em que fazia ou fez sentido, ou em que faz sentido estudar esse processo de autodeterminação. A relação entre Portugal e Timor, a relação entre Timor e Austrália, entre, entre Austrália e Indonésia, entre Timor e Indonésia, as Nações Unidas, eh, os Estados Unidos, eh, enfim, toda esta teia eh, está montada e nós estamos a tentar prescrutar um pouco o que se passou nesses, nesses limites. E é por isso que o Michael esteve cá uma temporada agora para trabalhar connosco sobre o nosso projeto e que uh, se voluntariou para fazer aqui uma conferência hoje à tarde sobre a autodeterminação de Timor-Leste, perspectivas a partir da Austrália. É isso que o vamos ouvir. Mike, muito obrigado por teres vindo, muito obrigado por aceitares falar aqui no SES. Uh, a palavra é tua. Flores, Muito obrigado. Obrigado, Rui, e obrigado por organizar esta oportunidade para uh, fazer um seminário aqui em, em uh, Coimbra, em um seis. E uh, obrigado a Barak, a Emerson Roto, a Mai, <risos> especialmente a Mau, Sávio, Axola, Laura Restauração. <risos> é, como, uh, é verdade que estive aqui em uh, 2010, e uh, obrigadinho aos seis para esta oportunidade, porque este foi o uh, primeiro momento do meu livro que o Rui uh, mencionou, mencionou, mencionou. Uh, e uh, começou aqui, em, no Sérgio. Então, uh, muito obrigado ao Sérgio. Uh, com as suas permissões, vou apresentar o inglês, está bem? Sim. <laughs> obrigado, Rui. Uh, so today, I would like to talk about the self-determination of Timor-Leste, perspectives from Australia. I've basically got two things to say. I want to talk about Australian policy toward Timor-Leste and self-determination between the years of the occupation, 1975 to 1999. And then secondly, I want to talk about the 2002-2018 maritime boundary dispute with Australia. Uh, I want to make it very clear for the recording, too, that in the first part, on which I am not um, an expert, I draw heavily on the work of Clinton Fernandez, who I recommend to all of you if you're interested in this period. So I just want to acknowledge Clinton uh, here. In the second part, as Rui mentioned, I was certainly um, aware and involved of the maritime boundary dispute, and that draws on my writings that you can see in the inside story. Uh, and I've compiled that hopefully into a very short understandable series of uh, dates and events. <coughs> so, uh, thank you, uh, Clinton uh, Fernandez. So, let's go through this. What I'm going to do is just go through some dates and talk about the overall theme is how Australia approached the issue of the decolonization of Portugal, then Portuguese Timor. And I want to put it into context, and I want to look at the issues and the evolving policy and how it rapidly changed in 1999. And then secondly, I will talk about how this issue um, continued in a way in terms of uh, sovereignty over the uh, maritime, <coughs> maritime boundary in the Timor Sea. So, in 1969, uh, there was no maritime boundary border with Portugal, <coughs> Portuguese Timor. And despite this, Australia granted exploration permits in the Timor Sea, including parts of the seabed that were closer to Timor than they were to the coast of Australia. Now, this reflected Australia's long-held position that it had a continental shelf that reached out. It was a geographic feature right up to close to Timor. Um, and these were granted for a six-year term to be renewed in the important date of 1975. Now, what Portugal does as the then colonial power of <coughs> Portuguese Timor is it granted a concession as well over those parts of the seabed. So there was a, Portugal was contesting Australia's assertion of sovereign rights over that continental shelf, and Australia launched a formal protest right back in 1969. Now, in 1972, Australia successfully concludes a maritime boundary with Indonesia in the surrounding region that is based on the continental shelf principles. Um, 
Now, even in 1972, the continental shelf principle was somewhat controversial, not as much as it later became. Uh, and the boundary with Indonesia in that area, where, though not in other areas, I should say, but in that area, the boundary of Indonesia uh, was much closer to Indonesia than to Australia. Now, Portugal refused to join those negotiations in 1972, uh, preferring to wait for the process which resulted in the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, or UNCLOS. There was already talk of that process, and there was already a sense that it would likely have a default position for a median line unless otherwise agreed. Portugal's decision there creates the Timor Gap. So, if you wonder what the Timor Gap was, that's the gap in the Australian Indonesian boundary where Portuguese, then Portuguese Timor was. So, uh, Prime Minister Whitlam meets Suharto in September 1974, and he advises Suharto that he was in favour of incorporation, but obeisance has to be paid to self-determination. So there has to be, he's indicating there has to be a show for Timorese self-determination. Uh, it's believed that until Whitlam's visit, Indonesian officials were undecided about Timor, and that was from the source of Major General Motopo, who was quite close to Suharto. Who later said, however, the Prime Minister's support for the idea of incorporation into Indonesia had helped them to crystallise their own thinking, and they were now firmly convinced of the wisdom of this course, or that's a paraphrase. There was a meeting in Townsville in April 1975, and Whitlam tells Suharto that the integration of Portuguese Timor should be done in a way that would not upset the Australian people. Okay. Oh, and I want to thank Teresa for this tice from Mozambique. <laughs> so, uh, in 16 September 1975, the Indonesians commence incursions into Atsavak on the um, western border. Mm -hmm. And Franklin <laughs> issues a statement recognising Portuguese sovereignty. Now, this is after the Civil War, so the Portuguese have already moved to Atahuru. Franklin calls for a fact-finding mission comprising of ASEAN countries and Australian New Zealand to visit the territory at a conference of interested parties to clear rumours and misunderstandings. Australia does not attend. Now, on 16 October, the Balibo Five journalists are killed. We're all, all working for Australian television statements and the Australian government maintains silence. Uh, as we all know, on 7 December, Indonesia invades. Uh, in the UN, the Australian Permanent Remission reports secretly. Our immediate diplomatic problem and task has been to do what we can to reduce the pressure on the Indonesians. And Australia ends up backing a mild resolution to avoid condemnation of Indonesia and to also avoid recognition of the RDTL, which was of course declared as a last um, uh, attempt to get the support of the world community on the 28th of November. So, moving ahead into the Fraser government, the Whitlam government falls shortly afterwards. Foreign Minister Peacock announces in January 1978 that the government has decided to accept East Timor as part of Indonesia. The Australian Ambassador to Indonesia receives information at this time from the Indonesian Department of Foreign Affairs that there's a major humanitarian catastrophe. This is the time of the greatest numbers of deaths in Timor Leste owing to famine, which was deliberately caused by Indonesian policy. Um, in September, there's an Australian ambassadorial visit and they are told that 125,000 people had come down from the mountains and almost a quarter of them were suffering from cholera, malaria, tuberculosis and advanced malnutrition. This is a very terrible time in Timor's history. On the 14th of February 1979, despite all this, Australia confirms its de jure recognition of Indonesia's uh, annexation. So, it hasn't gone as far as to formally uh, recognise it, but uh, in law, but de jure in, in effect. And no other country in the world offers this sort of uh, support for Indonesia's forced integration of the territory through the 24-year history. International humanitarian aid is finally allowed in November 1979, and there are some pretty awful photos from that time that you can find. Uh, DFAT prepared a cabinet submission noting a substantial humanitarian problem in Timor-Leste. As many as 200,000 Timorese are in urgent need of food and medical care. Uh, the Foreign Minister, who's a new Foreign Minister, Street advises Parliament in February 1982 that the General Assembly resolutions, that was a big issue in 1982, by the way, uh, and former Prime Minister Whitlam went to the UN to advocate on it, pretty much on Indonesia's behalf, that these are unrealistic and serve no practical purpose. The government considers that the incorporation of East Timor into Indonesia is now a reality, and that the Indonesian government is uh, in effective control. 
Then Defence Minister Ian Sinclair visits Timor and the visit is taken to express once again Australia's de jure recognition of Indonesian sovereignty. Then a new Labor government is elected in March 1983. Uh, on radio, when asked about Timor, um, Hawke, the new Prime Minister, says we have to restore full normal relations with Indonesia. Foreign Minister Bill Hayden visits Jakarta and said, I noted on behalf of the Australian government that Indonesia has incorporated East Timor into the Republic of Indonesia. But I also expressed our deep concern that an internationally supervised act of self-determination has not taken place in East Timor. Uh, by 1985, though, Hawke formally recognises East Timor as Indonesian territory, uh, which is a major support towards increased Australian support for the occupation. Ramos Orto, this fund calls Hawke's decision yet another demonstration of Australian subservience to a military dictatorship and of this government's hypocrisy, as well as a gross and irresponsible effort to undermine the complex peace process now underway. At this time, Portugal summons the Australian ambassador and delivers a strong protest over the Hawke's comments. So, by 1984, there's the fifth round of talks between Indonesia and Australia on maritime boundaries in the Timor Sea, which of course is a consequence of having recognised de jure authority of Indonesia over the former Portuguese Timor. Um, on 17 August, Hawke gives an interview on Indonesian TV where he is present for the Independence Day. When asked about East Timor, he says, we recognise the sovereign authority of Indonesia. At this point, Portugal recalls its ambassador. Canberra to for consultations. Um, the soon to be foreign minister, who is still in the Senate and is moving to the House of Representatives to become foreign minister, confirms his government has not revoked Fraser, the Fraser government's de jure recognition of Indonesian sovereignty. So that's, that's confirmed by the subsequent government. In the ALP National Conference, and this is the government at this time, in their party conference, there's a formal recognition of Indonesia's annexation of East Timor. Now, Ahead to 1989. This is where the Timor Gap Treaty is signed between Australia and Indonesia in an aircraft over the so-called zone of cooperation in the Timor Sea. <clears throat> and what is agreed between Australia and Indonesia is a 50-50 revenue share in the zone of cooperation. Obviously, to do this, uh, it depends on Australia's de jure recognition of the forced annexation. And here's that famous, infamous if you like, photo between Australian Foreign Minister Gareth Evans and the Indonesian Foreign Minister Ali Alatas clicking glasses over the Timor Sea in 1989. <coughs> now, Evans responds to criticisms of this treaty, of which there are plenty, by saying the world is a pretty unfair place. That has littered, littered over the course of decades and the centuries with examples of acquisitions by force which have proved to be, for whatever reason, irreversible. Of course, then we have the awful events of 12 November 1991 in Santa Cruz, which are captured on film by Max Stahl. <coughs> Evans describes this massacre as an aberration, not an act of state policy. <coughs> so you see Australian foreign policy going to some efforts to uh, minimise the impact on Indonesia of these events. Um, Evans, after talking with the Portuguese Foreign Minister Pinheiro, says uh, that the sovereignty issue is effectively closed whether you like it or not. Now, Portugal takes Australia to a, a case over the Timor Sea Treaty in the International Court of Justice, as you're probably aware, in 1995. And in that process, Australia's legal team is compelled to concede that even though it's dealing with Indonesia, it still recognised the people of East Timor's right to self-determination because it was a non-self-governing territory under Charter 11. <coughs> of the UN Charter. Now what actually happens in that case, after much debate, is because Indonesia is not a signatory to the International Court of Justice, has not acceded to that treaty, even though Portugal and Australia have, the judges considered that you know, the question of Indonesia's sovereignty was so central to the dispute that they could not decide it <coughs> without Indonesia being a party and Indonesia was not a party. So in the end, that's what happened in the International Court of Justice. The case went nowhere. <clears throat> now, in March 1996, the Liberal Prime Minister, John Howard, comes to power. His Foreign Minister uh, and Leader of the Government and Senate says, successive Australian governments have recognised Indonesia's sovereignty over East Timor since 1979 and there is no change of policy. <clears throat> By 
but it also still pays some verbal regard, nominally, to the Indonesian, the East Timorese right of self-determination. Now, as we know, getting into more familiar territory here perhaps, there's an economic crisis in Indonesia by 1998. Now, at this point, the Labour Party changes its position in opposition under Laurie Brereton, a new foreign policy spokesman. Now, bear in mind, the Cold War has ended. It's been over for some seven or eight years now. Indonesia is in a weak position uh, relative to where it had been a couple of years before. Um, Obviously, some of the geopolitical factors that had got de facto support for Indonesia's annexation had changed quite substantially since 1991. Um, and <clears throat> the Labour Party, and this is a very significant move, fractures the bipartisan consensus in January 1998, passing a motion that had originally started in the New South Wales Labour Party conference. A Labour government will lend every encouragement to international efforts to peacefully resolve the East Timor conflict. It is Labour's considered view that no lasting solution to the conflict in East Timor is likely in the absence of a process of negotiation through which the people of East Timor can exercise their right of self-determination. Now, <clears throat> in foreign policy, in most countries, uh, most key positions are bipartisan. So the, the fact that the Labour Party was not in government, uh, it, it's still very significant that they changed their policy on a foreign policy issue. It puts a lot of pressure on the government uh, to shift its position uh, because states have permanent interests, Labour Party will eventually be in government, this is a serious challenge. Now, Australian Prime Minister John Howard famously, in 1998, later in the year, writes to President Habibi, who's been in office now since May, <coughs> suggesting that the East Timorese desire for an act of self-determination could be addressed in a manner that avoids an early and final decision. And he cites the Matignon Accords, which have just taken place in New Caledonia where the French are proposing an extended process uh, of devolution of power to a local assembly that will end much later in a referendum. In fact, that referendum took place only last year, uh, in 2018, so that was a very extended process. Yeah. Um, so how it's citing the Matinon Accords way back in 1998, December, saying they enabled a compromise political solution to be implemented while deferring a referendum on the final status for many years. <clears throat> now, Habibi reacts, eventually reacts, to this by calling a referendum uh, in East Timor. And, of course, we have the May 5 agreement that's been auspiced by the UN under Kofi Annan between Portugal and Indonesia. That leads later to the August 30, 1999 referendum, which will be celebrating the 20th anniversary of later this year, <coughs> which, as you know, leads to a 78.5% vote for independence among the Timorese. Militia violence, of course, continues as it has all through 1999. These are being organised and orchestrated by the TNI, uh, and they get worse after the result. At this point in Australia, the Australian government does not want to intervene. Uh, it has made no real preparations other than to evacuate Australian citizens. But at this point, we finally see uh, in Australia huge public protests in support of East Timor uh, to, to pressure an unwilling government to intervene. And these protests include people who don't normally go to protests, very conservative people. Uh, the Catholic Church is very involved. Um, the government says, which has been in office for three years, says it never received so many contacts from ordinary Australians about an issue ever. Uh, and so they're under incredible pressure from the public to act, to intervene, as people see the very distressing images coming out of East Timor after the ballot has been won. So the Australian government calls on the US to support it on the basis of its long-standing alliance with the US, and the US begins to pressure Indonesia to accept an Australian-led interfect force. Clinton publicly warns, um, I believe this was at APEC, in New Zealand, if Indonesia does not end the violence, it must invite it must invite the international community to assist in restoring security. It would be a pity if the Indonesian recovery was crashed by this. So that's that's pretty threatening language diplomatically. And uh, Richard Holbrook takes it further and warns that on 12 September that Indonesia faces the point of no return in international relations if it does not accept an international peacekeeping force. Now, of course, that is taking the gloves off in diplomatic language. And later that day, after meetings, Habibi announces that the government will allow 
and UN force into East Timor. It initially argued against Australia leading that force. The US made it plain that that would not be acceptable, <clears throat> and so they accepted the proposal. Of course, Intervet was a multinational force, including a range of nations, ultimately including Malaysia, Portugal, and a whole range of others. So now we get to the history of the dispute over the maritime boundary, which uh, then commences, <clears throat> in a sense. So with the restoration of East Timor's independence 17 years ago today, uh, the zone of cooperation has to be renegotiated. Obviously, it is no longer territory between Indonesia and Australia. Not that it ever was. But Australia recognises that it no longer is, and it needs to renegotiate with Timor-Leste. Now, of course, in this time, UNCLOS has come into force since 1982. And under UNCLOS, fairly standard international practice is that maritime boundaries will be at the median point unless otherwise agreed. So, um, Australia voluntarily acceded to that in 1994. Actually, it points to a 200 mile boundary, but of course, where two nations are closer than 400, it has to be a median uh, line, well, unless otherwise agreed. And of course, Australia and Timor Leste are close enough for that to come into play. So, however, Australia drops out of the International Court of Justice jurisdiction on the law of the sea two months before the restoration of Timor's independence uh, earlier in 2002. It also withdraws from uh, the UNCLOS dispute resolution proceeding. These unilateral actions leave Timor Leste with no option of an international arbitration. This is an important point. So an arbitration is like a judge's decision. There's no option for Timor Leste to <coughs> pursue that because Australia has now dropped out of these two dispute resolution procedures. This withdrawal was actually conducted in secret. The public, the Australian public, did not know it was happening, and the Parliament, in fact, was only informed after the reservations took effect. So it was done by the executive. Uh, it's interesting to note that Australia then settled its maritime boundary with New Zealand along median lines only two years later in 2004. Now, so the 1989 Zone of Cooperation at this time in 2002 is renamed the Joint Petroleum Development Area, or JPDA. It's renegotiated to give Timor-Leste 90% of the revenues in that area, and I'll show you a map in a second. But of course, while this might appear generous, Timor-Leste had a very good claim in international law to the entire area of the JPDA. Importantly, the JPDA also excluded on its uh, western boundaries uh, other existing fields, Laminara, Carolina, and Buffalo. These were already operating. These were outside the, the zone of cooperation, but not by very much. Outside of the JPDA, but not by very much. And <clears throat> had this been fully arbitrated, it might have been found that those fields as well were in Timorese sovereign waters. Now, the thing is, in 2002, the JPDA's remaining lifespan is limited. And the picture is complicated by other negotiations, subsequent negotiations, over an undeveloped field, where to sunrise, and I'll show you a map in a sec, after this slide. <coughs> because I need to tell you this so you'll understand the map. The next thing that happens is the Sunrise International Unitization Agreement in 2003. What that does is put 20% of Greater Sunrise, which is on the eastern border of the JPDA, declares 20% of it to be inside the Joint Petroleum Development Area. Let me just go to the map and show you before I come back. So it's suggesting, the unitization agreement is suggesting that there's Greater Sunrise. It's saying that 20% of Greater Sunrise is in the Joint Petroleum Development Area that I just spoke about. Now in the Joint Petroleum Development Area, Timor-Leste, under these provisions, is entitled to 90% of the revenues. But this is the median line. This is the border with Indonesia on the continental shelf, much closer to Indonesia and to Timor-Leste. This is the Timor Gap. This is the resource sharing area, the JPPA. 90% <clears throat> to Timor, but here's the median line, which if there was a median line boundary would be, of course, 100% to Timor. And the Sunrise Unitization Agreement is saying that this field, which hasn't been developed, it's greater sunrise, is 20% in the JPDA. So let's go back and look at what the significance of that means. If 20% is in the JPDA and Timor only gets 
of the revenue, then that's 18%. So Timor is entitled to 18% of the Greater Sunrise field whenever it is developed of the royalties. Now the next thing that happens is the certain maritime arrangements in the Timor Sea Treaty, CMATS. This is a very famous treaty, 2006. What that does is increase Timor Leste's share of upstream revenues in Greater Sunrise from 18 to 50 percent. So can you go back? Uh, yes. That. Um, so what about the other 80 percent of the Greater Sunrise? Australia. Australia. Yeah. yeah. So I'll show you the map again. See, it's below the Indonesian boundary. Australia. Yeah. In fact, 82. <coughs> on JPDA principle. Because Australia will get another 2% from the JPDA. So, the CMAP treaty increases Timor's prospective future share from 18% to 50%, but on the condition that permanent, permanent maritime boundary negotiations are delayed for 50 years. So that's what we call a moratorium provision in English. Now, Timor Leste accedes to the treaty in 2007, but it's important to note it had no option of an arbitrated settlement. So, it, as a small power, would have considered whether to challenge this treaty, but of course, it had no option of an arbitrated settlement because Australia had dropped out of the dispute resolution procedures. So, what that effectively did was uh, place it outside the realm of international law and firmly in the realm of power politics. So that's where we are in 2006. Let's go back to the map and kind of appreciate it again. So <coughs> here's the JPDA based on the old zone of cooperation. Uh, here are the lateral boundaries. Now, the thing about the lateral boundaries is uh, there might have been arguments that they could have come out this way slightly um, as well. Here's the continental shelf boundary with Indonesia settled in 1972. There's the gap. There is no boundary here. There is still no boundary after these treaties. That's an important point. These treaties do not create a maritime boundary. They delay a maritime boundary. What they do is create a resource sharing area with under, under agreements for resource sharing. 90% to Timor, 10% to Australia, but would be 100% to Timor in a million line situation. And there's sunrise, 20% poking in, in Australian territory, the other 80. So, um, and outside here, I might, reinforce uh, existing fields like Laminaria Coralina and Buffalo that are outside the JPJ at 100% Australian royalties. So. <coughs> now, the espionage case then uh, is the other, next part of the story. So much later, around 2013, um, there's a, uh, allegations of Australian espionage in 2004 when CMAX was being negotiated. The key allegation comes from a relatively credible source. It's a former ACES agent, Witness K, Australian uh, uh, Security Service agent, Witness, who has to be known as Witness K, never been identified. Uh, they, uh, that person alleges that Australian intelligence operatives spied on the Timorese negotiating team for CMAX in 2004. And he got permission to make a complaint because um, he was concerned that this is shortly after the Australian Embassy is bombed in Jakarta, by the way. He was concerned that a lot of resources were going into something that was about a commercial advantage for Australian companies in these revenue sharing talks when there were other <coughs> massive security issues going on that, in his view, ACES ought to have been looking at. Um, uh, later we learned that the espionage involved planting listening devices under the guise of an OSAD project in, uh, when renovating government offices. These are the allegations made by Witness K. Witness K uh, later claimed uh, he or she was motivated by former Foreign Minister Alexander Downer later accepting a role as a lobbyist for Woodside Petroleum, which is of course the main lead company involved in the Greater Sunrise Future Development. So, there's a long story there that I don't want to get into, and that case is still ongoing. Um, and the uh, uh, lawyer, the counsel, legal counsel <coughs> the legal counsel in this arbitration is also subject to this uh, process. They, are now, they have now been charged under um, 
Intelligence Act uh, with, with offences and that process is, is ongoing today. So it's not like all this issue is resolved. Timor Leste, as a result, commences an arbitration in The Hague and seeks to have the treaty nullified, the CMF treaty nullified, under the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties principle that negotiations should take place in good faith. And of course, they now have evidence that they did not. Now, uh, that, uh, the Timor Leste's counsel in Australia is Bernard Caleri. There's a raid on Bernard Caleri's offices at that time. The Attorney General Brandis asserts that ASIO, in the country it's ASIO, uh, outside the country it's ASIS, uh, is interested in preventing identification of Australian intelligence activities and identities. And that's the motivation for the raid. But of course the impact of the raid is that Witness K has uh, his passport re removed, other documents are removed, and once Witness K has his passport re removed, he cannot testify uh, in the arbitration in The Hague. So this case loses a key witness as a result of the Australian intelligence activities. Now, what happens later is that uh, Timor Leste, no, as I explained, has no option of an arbitrated settlement. But there is another process in UNCLOS, in the UN Conventional Law of the Sea, uh, that Australia could not um, make reservations about, which is a conciliation process, compulsory conciliation process. Now, just to explain what that is, that is not a judge making a decision, that is both parties being brought together by conciliators and being pressured to reach an agreement. But it's not enforceable, and they find that they do a report which outlines the conciliation panel's assessment of the various legal claims, and they produce a report, but they cannot enforce a finding. So this is very different to the arbitration, and Timor Leste can't go to an arbitration. But it does have this process, and this process has never been used before under UNCLOS, so the first time. Timor Leste, in a world first, uses the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea Conciliation process. Now, Australia is still standing by CMATS and opposing uh, uh, the termination of CMATS, and still standing by the 50-year moratorium on barrier negotiations. But this all changes. Fast forward about nine months, and the CMATS is terminated by Timor Leste and Australia does not challenge the termination, so they've reached an agreement. Why does that happen when Australia, only months before, is standing by its decades-long policy of pursuing a continental shelf, continental shelf boundary, of also pursuing a maritime boundary negotiation if it can't get a continental shelf boundary, uh, avoiding, trying to avoid the issue of finalising maritime boundaries? Why does that happen? Well, firstly, it wants the espionage case in The Hague to end. <clears throat> and if Timor agrees, there's a process of confidence building measures, and one of the things that Timor agrees to do is to drop that case, and Timor drops that case. Uh, the other thing that happened that was really critical was this. Australia went into the conciliation arguing that this matter had already been settled. There is no dispute. The CMAPS treaty uh, has settled the border dispute by with Timor's agreement by saying that it should be put off for 50 years. So there is no dispute. So that's the Australian opening legal argument that there is no dispute. It's already been determined by the CMAT's treaty. Now, this argument is completely dismissed by the judges. It's even dismissed by the two judges that the Australians appointed. So it was, um, it was roundly dismissed. Uh, they find instead that Australia's obligation under international law to settle the maritime boundary had survived the treaty. You can't contract out of this obligation, uh, despite the purported moratorium. Now, Timor Leste could agree to a continental shelf boundary, that's fine, but Timor Leste did not agree to a continental shelf boundary. So, uh, but what, it can't, what Australia can't do is try to avoid any maritime boundary determination. So that was a really critical moment. And once Australia had lost this opening argument, CMATS was actually of very little use to it any longer. So the CMATS treaty was all about a 50-year moratorium on a maritime boundary. So without that, uh, without that core part of CMATS, Australia had no use for CMATS, so it was happy uh, to agree to its termination. Now, the third factor was the South China Sea dispute. This became an issue in international politics, as you know, it was going on between uh, the Philippines and other Southeast Asian countries and China. 
Australia was saying that China should stand by the rule of law in relation to the maritime boundary determination, uh, to the decisions that were taken in international law. And of course, China was arguing back that Australia was not doing that in the dispute with Timor Leste. This created a big public relations headache for Australia. So that's another part of the context. So, Australia agrees for the termination of Siemens. Now, come September 2017, Timor-Leste and Australia issue through the UNCLOS conciliation panel a statement saying they have reached agreement on central aspects of a maritime boundary determination. We don't find out what they are until March 2018, when the details are made public. And what the details are is that the JPDA will no longer be called the JPDA because it will not be joint. Uh, it will be Timorese sovereign waters, and of course that means they will get 100% of the royalties in those fields in the former JPDA. It also says, somewhat surprisingly, that Timor will also have sovereignty over the Buffalo and Laminaria Coralina fields, slightly to the west of the old JPDA. But the important thing about that is that all those fields are ending, uh, nearing the end of their life. So um, there's believed to be some oil and gas still in Buffalo, but they're nearing the end of their life. So far more si financially significant is the as yet untapped Greater Sunrise field. So what's happening with that this becomes the big question. There's believed to be in excess of $40 billion there. All of that, some eight to 10 billion would, rep would be represented by uh, sovereign governments' revenues. So what percentage is Timor going to get of that? Uh, and we find out that Timor-Leste has secured in this process a major increase in royalties from those fields. Up from 50% under CMAS, you'll recall, to either 70 or 80%, depending on whether the pipeline goes to Timor, in which case it will be 70, or Darwin, in which case it will be 80. Now, the issue of where the pipeline goes has um, was at this point is, is not resolved. So um, that's still an ongoing issue. Uh, now it's an issue between the government of Timor-Leste has made its preferences very clear and, uh, and Woodside. Uh, that it's progressed from this point. It does seem very clear now that Timor-Leste will be seeking uh, for the pipeline to go to uh, Timor-Leste. And of course now it's an issue of financing and so on. Timor-Leste has now bought out two of the partners of the joint venture and owns a majority stake in Greater Sunrise. So that's very likely to happen that one day we'll go to uh, Timor, south coast Tasimane. Anyway, back to this. Um, that no longer concerns Australia directly, although Australia does have a say because it retains either 30 or 20 percent <coughs> of those revenues in Greater Sunrise. So they have to agree to it. More revenue streams are possible following the Timor Leste's acquisition of this majority stake that I just mentioned, but they will also bring greater costs. But I'm not here to talk about that today. I'm here to talk about the outcome of the UNCLOS compulsory conciliation. I just wanted to give you that information. So that's what occurs uh, as a, by agreement as a result of the conciliation, which vindicates, vindicates completely Timor Leste's decision to use the UNCLOS conciliation. Uh, process which had never previously been used. And it's actually a great victory for international law in the, <coughs> in the region. It also deals a fatal blow to decades of Australian foreign policy, which had sought to delay maritime boundary determination until oil and gas reserves were depleted. Um, this was likely, the delay of the moratorium was likely because Australia had become aware, of course, that its favoured continental shelf position successfully pursued in 1972 was now out of favour in international law. Australia never admitted that publicly, but they must have been aware that that would be a difficult argument to make with an independent Timor Leste. Australia also had great fears that this would bring the 1972 boundary uh, into question with Indonesia. But as I was arguing and others on you know, national media, uh, these fears were quite likely unfounded. There's a major difference in international law between a boundary settled and observed for 45 years, like the Australia-Indonesia boundary, and one that had never previously been determined. So, here's the new Timor Sea boundaries. So I'd like to talk about this 
for a little bit. So this is the bio wind down field coming to the end of its life. Um, in there now is this buffalo and laminaria corallina on this western uh, boundary. You see now that there is a median line boundary between Australia and Timor Leste. That's the median line. So the boundary from Australia's perspective goes like this and then like this. So from the continental shelf with Indonesia 972 to a median line with Timor Leste. So Timor Leste has done better than Indonesia did <laughs> in this. Uh, of course, very different time as it's been negotiated. Now, what's happened here, as you can see, is this division of greater sunrise by the boundary more or less reflects the 70 to 80 percent that is decided upon in the negotiations. And you can see that it appears to be more or less like 70 or 80 percent. Now, some people argue, well, why isn't all of greater sunrise uh, Timorese? Um, Yes, uh, Timor had a case for that, but even the original documents that Timor had produced way back in 2002 with some very senior uh, international law barristers uh, said there were certainly, you know, lateral boundaries are a slightly different issue in international law to these equidistance boundaries that sort of go east-west. These north-south boundaries, there's all sorts of technical things around offsets. Do you take into account this part of Australia, or this part of Australia, or that part of Timor Leste, or Jaco, do you know what I mean? There are some arguments around, around that. So that, that was never quite as clear in international law. Um, advocates like to make things as clear as possible, you know, and fair enough. Uh, but that was never as clear in international law as this was. This was very clear. So there you go, there's a new boundary. Now there are some points here that can be, in future, altered very slightly, depending on how Timor Leste's boundary negotiations with Indonesia go. These have not occurred yet, so the Maritime Boundary Office that the East Timor is set up has now concluded maritime boundaries with Australia, but the process of maritime boundaries with Indonesia, which of course involves a lot more territory in Oikursi, the north coast, Tasifeto, uh, also here, involves questions here. Um, these can in future be altered slightly to line up with uh, the arrangements that are made between Timor Leste and Indonesia. However, they cannot be altered until Greater Sunrise is depleted. So there's still that kind of certainty and permanence there from the Australian perspective. And that is Australian perspectives on Timor Leste's self determination uh, from 1969, I guess, through to. Uh, 2019. Thank you very much. Muito obrigado. Obrigado, Marco.